Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to our Lunchtime Webinar Express series. We've got a great session today to kick off the 2024 series with the CEO of Brilliant Noise, Anthony Mayfield. If you'd like to turn on your webcam, Anthony, I'll pass things over to you and away you go when you're ready. Um, fortune favours the prepared mind. Um, that's a, a quote many of you be familiar with. It's from the, um, the wonderful and famous microbiologist Louis Pasteur, best uh, known today, of course, for making milk less likely to kill us. Um, but it's a lovely phrase. Um, fortune favours the prepared mind. You can't make your own luck, but you can be ready for it when it comes along. So that's what today is all about, really. It's about how do our minds need to change or be prepared for artificial intelligence, for generative AI specifically. And I'm going to try and start the top on that journey or maybe help us along on that journey, as I'm sure many of you have already started to look at it. And we're going to start with history. We're going to start with the history of artificial intelligence in two scientific papers and three movies. I like films, um, so I, I prefer them to scientific papers, if I'm honest. Um, so I'm going to explain artificial intelligence and how we got to where we are today and why today is so exciting and why it is a revolution. A revolution, of course, is an is a overused term these days. I mean, we've, we've lived through a couple of them anyway in terms of technology, mostly in our lifetimes. We've seen the, the web, social media, mobile phones, all part of this broader digital revolution. Tara Swisher says, the, the famous journalist who brought out a lovely book this weekend called Burn Book, all about the last 20 years or so of it. Um, everything that will be digitized, can be digitized, will be digitized. But a revolution is when the world turns upside down and you can feel it sometimes. You can feel things shifting, things moving a little bit fast for comfort, maybe. Um, and we often feel it, I think, when we suddenly realize that everything we knew before might be slightly different, might have changed by something. So this is the first of the scientific papers. Um, and it's from 1950, that's really where the sto our story of artificial intelligence starts. And it starts with Alan Turing um, writing a paper called, which he calls the, the Imitation Game, um, which actually preceded the movie. It's not a screenplay, it is a scientific paper. It begins with a lovely, lovely sentence. I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And he goes on to imagine how, as digital computers, like the one that he invented at Bletchley Park, um, advance whether they would be able to start to think and how we'd be able to tell if they were able to start to think. I've also included the last sentence in his essay. He was a beautiful writer, actually, a pretty beautiful thinker, um, which is, in conclusion, he wasn't sure what comes next, but he said, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. And that, my friends, is very much the case today with generative AI for all of us as it comes crashing into our world. So here are the three movies that we're going to explain um, artificial intelligence in, and it corresponds briefly, more or less to three phases in the technology's development. So the idea of artificial intelligence has been there for a long time. The definition of it tends to shift um, over time, and it tends to shift to whatever we can't quite do now. In fact, then that's another, another conversation. So in three movies, if you've seen any of these, then hurrah. If you haven't, then don't worry. But um, you should watch all of them because they're excellent. Um, the Imitation Game, of course, is where Alan Turing and his team crack the Enigma code, um, a fiendishly difficult um, enemy code, using a computer that can um, that can do it before the day is out and warn everybody of, of what the enemy movements are. And that's really the phase of computing where it was all about logic and brute force calculation. If you could just do enough calculations, if you could just do think things through logically, then you would at some point be able to create artificial intelligence. And that kept running into walls. It didn't quite work. No one was quite sure why. And there were a number of what were called AI winters, where basically people gave up believing in the idea that you could create machines that could think or that could help you think. The second phase of artificial intelligence in this broad sweep comes 50 years later um, in the 2000s with the advent of machine learning and big data. And basically, I mean, you probably all remember from that hype cycle, or if you were too young, it was 
I know there's a lot of talk about big data, but basically if there was enough data there, you had these huge amounts of data that we were suddenly able to store and gather. We could point machines at them and we could predict things. We could see things that we couldn't see there before because the data was too big for us to comprehend. And that, that went a certain way, but it didn't quite get people to the point where, for instance, the, the, the big puzzle of artificial intelligence research was how do you get machines to understand language? Language seems really simple, but it's actually really, really complicated. And that brings us, so that, 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 that movie is Moneyball. And if you haven't seen Moneyball, it's a true story um, where Brad Pitt playing Billy Bean um, wins the American Baseball League or something like that um, with not a lot of money because he meets a quant, um, somebody who understands big data played by Jonah Hill. And they figure out how this kind of team of misfits um, who are people who don't look like they should be winners, but actually the data show are winners. Um, so that's money, that's money. Well, then we come to the third movie, and this is the most wonderful and strangest of them all. Um, and if you've seen it, you'll know what I mean, because it's it's a it's a very beautiful film. Um, but this is the film that expresses and gives birth to, bizarrely, um, generative artificial intelligence, because it cracks language. It's about a linguist, it's about, um, played by Amy Adams, and Amy Adams is called on by the US government because aliens have landed everywhere across the, the world. And um, the aliens are having meetings with humans, and they're behind these big screens in this fog, they're strange people, and things like that. Um, and it is absolutely imperative, for plot reasons, that, um, that, that Amy Adams um, manages to crack how their language works, but they speak in these strange circles. You can see one there silhouetted behind her, her head. They speak in these strange circles of, of, of words that appear all, all at once, and they just can't figure out what this language is. Um, and what, what it turns out, this language is, is um, why, it, why it's so difficult for humans to understand is because the aliens think about language in a different way. They don't say a sentence in a, in a row, they say a whole sentence at once with all of the context around it. And um, that's why it's a circle. Um, and there's a moment in the film, I won't spoil it, but there's a moment in the film where we understand why this is and suddenly we see the world differently. Suddenly we experience the character's experience and we vicariously experience a revolution, um, a turning upside down thinking. Now the incredible thing about this, and if you see the film, it really is marvelous. I'll stop saying that. But if you think of them, then you'll know that that it really does feel like it's one of the best plot twists or best kind of flipping of perceptions you've ever seen. Um, but the amazing thing is that in the audience for that film in 2017, 2018, um, was a Google scientist. Um, unfortunately, they, these Google scientists aren't as quotable as Alan Turing, so I've got half a sentence um, from their abstract, which is, is vaguely quotable. Um, everything else is, gets very technical very quickly. But it, it says, we propose a new simple architecture, the transformer. Bam, bam, bam. So the transformer is where generative AI comes from. Um, and we, it's used then to build generative pre-trained transformers, which are basically models of information, great big models, huge models of information. And that's where the phrase GPT comes from. At the same time as this being incredible, it's really, really important to realise that 2018 was not long ago, that GPT-3 was released by OpenAI, um, that model, or a, a, a chat GPT was released in November um, 2022, which was a ridiculously short time ago. This is the beginning. What we're seeing at the moment is lots of corporations and organizations coming to us with packaged solutions saying, this is what it is, this is how you do it, this is how you buy it. The issue is, is it's so early with this technology um, and the newness of this technology, the revolutionary nature of it, the truly revolutionary nature of it, that really nobody knows anything. They don't know where it's going. They're not sure how to control it, how to tame it. So the problem with understanding generative AI is that it looks familiar. It looks like a chatbot. It looks like a search engine, um, but it's not. It's, it's none of those things. The best way that we've come up with to think about 
um, AI is to think of it as a cognitive accelerator. So don't think of it as a super intelligence or as a search engine or as a database, but think of it as something that can and does speed up how you think. It gets you there faster. I think it's also helpful to think of it as not at all. Um, there's something just to be learned, to be bought, learned, and then integrated into our work. It's much better understood, I think, especially for marketers, as something that can make tools for us. It can make tools for us that help us speed up and get where we want to go faster. Um, McKinsey last year published a report about the economic impact of AI and rather um, charmingly said that it would have a 15% impact on marketing. I don't know about you, but um, the idea of having some impact on me um, or being impacted doesn't sound very nice. And I think what they were referring to was um, potential cost savings, but also potential job losses. That makes us very nervous and, and rightly so. Um, the thing about AI in marketing is there are kind of three patterns that we can see at the moment. Um, the first one comes generally from people who think in spreadsheets um, and they think in spreadsheets and they see numbers and they see numbers of, that represent people's salaries and numbers that represent outputs and think, oh, well, we've got some AI coming along so we can do with less of those and get the same out at the other end. It's a really, really blinkered view because what they're not bearing in mind is nobody knows anything. They don't understand AI and where it's going yet, and therefore they're making decisions about it as if it was another time-saving, cost-saving tool. Um, if you think about it as a cognitive accelerator, then it's probably a good idea to think about how you do more with the brains that you've got, how you think about the brains um, that you've got and how you can speed them up. The second thing, second pattern we see this year is tech solutionism. We very often get asked um, at Brilliant Noise, which platforms should we um, invest in? And there are many answers to that, but the, the, the most important answer is it doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I would suggest at the moment that you look at things like um, ChatGPT, or Microsoft Copilot, tools that are specific to your trade that, that seem to perform well, try them out. Don't buy them on year contracts, buy them on monthly contracts. But the idea that, that there are one-stop shops coming, that Microsoft or Google is going to arrive with something that works perfectly is just, is just not going to happen. There's not going to be one solution that fits everybody, um, but people are going to try and sell you them. And the third thing is, that is what we call the Red Queen effect, um, which is a term from evolutionary uh, science where um, basically two species that compete, predator and prey are competing with each other um, and they keep evolving and getting better and better and better, but each one evolves in response to the other one. So they never really get anywhere. Like the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland, they run on the spot. And I think that's probably what we're gonna see in ad tech um, a lot is AI being added to everything, lots of big promises being made with AI, but no real progress in terms of competition, just kind of as ad tech has been doing for many years, it's running, running to stand still. Um, frustratingly, especially for clients. So how to learn? This is the important thing. How do, we, how do we learn, how do we prepare our minds when things are moving so quickly? Um, well, I've got some ideas. Um, I think, first of all, it's important to understand why it's important, why it's important to start learning and start learning now. There's a lot of um, organizations where it, um, Generative AI is placed within the training budget, or there's a big team somewhere that's looking at uh, how to integrate generative AI, and they're gonna get back to you in six months or a year. Um, and again, that's probably because we're thinking in terms of big solutions that are gonna be landed on everyone. But I think the it's important to bear in mind that the return on investment for personally and organizationally for learning about generative AI, that ROI is cumulative. Like, straight away you're going to be saving time a lot of time just on administrative tasks just on internal stuff don't even think about how it's going to interact with customers yet don't even think about those things but just the applying it to the boring things applying it to the bits of processes that seem to take a long time so for instance meeting notes for instance um, strategic planning where there are complicated bits of knowledge to piece together all of those things can be sped up and very very fast we've seen from Boston Consulting Group, um, where there's been a lot of study by business schools that you can get about a day a week back um, 
and you can get about 40% increase in the quality of the work that's being done. And that's by highly paid knowledge professionals. We're seeing more and more data coming out of uh, government and, um, a, and again out of management consultancies saying that, that, that um, those time savings are huge. Um, and that's certainly our experience as well. We don't like to talk so much about the kind of time savings that we're getting because they sound a bit incredible until, we, <laughs> until you're actually using it yourself. The other thing I'd say is also that um, literacy is transferable. So if you're learning about how to write prompts and how to use generative AI with ChatGPT or with Copilot or with Google or whatever, then what you're learning there will be transferable to other platforms as well. Um, it, it seems that what you learn about how to prompt, for instance, can travel very, very quickly. And the last thing is to think like a scientist, um, to think of it in terms of experiments and running experiments and recording it and keeping an eye on it. Now, this is a slide that's, that I think is quite important um, for us all to understand. If you're just starting your AI journey, if you're just getting into it, then really the thing to focus on is learning how to prompt, learning how to ask questions of AI. And you're basically going to get gains from thinking about how you work and then applying that um, into an AI and helping you speed it up. But there are levels above that of learning or levels beyond that where things get even more sophisticated and even more um, even more exciting, really. Um, where you go after being able to ask simple questions and get help with writing or planning or reporting or whatever is putting together more advanced prompts and putting together chains of prompts um, so you can you can achieve much more sophisticated things. Again, my reminder is think of this as things to speed up your brain rather than to replace the work that you're doing. Beyond that, and this sounds um, if you've not if you've not experienced it yet, then um, this sounds like it's technical and very complicated, but it's really not. Um, the, the next step after that really is creating custom chatbots, which is effectively where you can put in bits of your own data or even just like PDFs with some reports in it um, and your prompt and kind of hold them there as a as a custom version of ChatGPT or whatever you're using. And that's really, really powerful. We have ones to help us. Um, write reports, for instance, or to um, help us with um, schedules of work or to help us with all sorts of things. Um, when, they, when this feature came out in ChatGPT, I think we built about 20 of these chatbots in a week. It's really, really easy once you've learned those previous steps. And then the step beyond that, and this is mind boggling, but it works incredibly smoothly once you get used to it, is, is teams of chatbots, um, which is where you can build chatbots that are specialist in thinking about one thing or another thing or have a little bit of data that's specialized in a certain area and you can kind of bring them into a conversation and build on the results with each other. Again, I want to stress this sounds technical, but it's really, really not. What, what this is is conversational computing, I think it's sometimes described as. So all of the things that we would previously as perhaps knowledge workers, marketers, forgive me if you're a coder then um, congratulations, but um, for those of us who, who can't code, we would have to brief someone or ask if it was possible. And instead of that, you can start building or start um, making um, things yourself. Now, if you just take away one thing, apart from like, it's really important to get involved and understand AI, if you take away just one thing um, from this, um, I was talking uh, with one of the lovely organizers um, of this event beforehand, and they said they hadn't done much with ChatGPT. This would be the slide that I would recommend to her is that you just need to learn to phrase your questions to ChatGPT or whatever AI you're working with in three parts. Um, and there are many different ways of doing it. This is mine, um, or this is the one that I've chosen. Um, and it's, first of all, give it a role, tell it it, it is something. You are a researcher in um, X field or whatever. You can be very specific or you can be very general given the task that you're trying to do. I'm trying to write a brief about um, reaching people in X demographic um, in Y geographic area. Um, and then give it a format. I would like you to give me this in the form of, actually just give me a creative brief um, uh, and outline the things in there that should be in there based on the insights, something like that. Um, or you could have it as bullet points or prose or whatever you like. Or you can have it as a Dolly Parton song. That's always a favorite. But that's, that's, take your picture of this, take your, get your download of the slides, and this is the one to print out and put on your desk 
and you will go a long, long way with just learning how to prompt a little bit better with this. And the reason that that works is that it's 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 focusing that great big model that's been built, that great big GPT, and it's making it into a tool for the kind of work that you're doing. I said think like a scientist. This is and this is a a constant thing for us. We're not scientists. We 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 come gen actually what what of us is a material scientist but um he's got a doctorate in it so now i'm gonna have to go and apologize sorry jason um but the rest of us aren't scientists but learning to think like scientists really really helps learning to have a structured thought process about what we're doing learning to be really humble about what we know and what we don't know um and insisting on experimenting and learning from failures in order to improve and then i think um, having some critical thinking and scepticism about things, not cynicism, that's going to stop you trying things out, but scepticism, how does that work? Why does that work? That's really, really healthy. Because these are the phases that we're all going to go through. Right now, the phase that we're all in and could be in for a while is everything that we do already in our work, in, in, our, in our offices, we're going to do a bit better and then a lot better. And after we've been doing that for a while, um, then, and again, some people are doing this already, but we're going to start to do it in new ways. So Boston Consulting Group, for instance, who I mentioned the um, Harvard Business School study was on showing those big productivity gains. I read a piece with their, um, one of their managing directors recently who said that, yes, that, that was a really good productivity gain. When we started applying it to whole processes and thinking about whole processes, the productivity gains we, we were getting for knowledge workers were around 40 to 50%. So really interesting. And then I think beyond that, it's, we'll just start doing new things. But at the moment, it really annoys all of our work, really briefing and workshops and coaching and all those sorts of things tend to be around that do what you do better. Because again, a bit like that, those different levels of using AI, it's cumulative. It leads to the next thing. You get better and better. Um, so these are some practices. I think we've got about 10 minutes left. So um, I'm just gonna cover some practices, things that you can do um, and ways that you can think that, that might help you to start understanding how this can help you in your job. And um, you notice that I'm talking very much at an individual level. All of this, all of this works really, really well with teams. Um, but, and that's the area that we tend to work in, but get started yourself, um, you know, my advice, and this is some very simple things, um, is, is, is pay for it. Um, so the free version of ChatGPT is good. I mean, it's, it's a miracle, actually. <laughs> but, um, but the ChatGPT version 4, I think if you, uh, as a comparison, ChatGPT 3, which is the free one, 3.5, um, is able to pass the American solicitor's exam in the 33rd percentile, which is an incredible thing for a machine to do. It would pass the Turing test, I suppose, straight away. ChatGPT4 um, passes it in the 98th percentile. That's not the only measure, but it's just a way of thinking like, so I can have the free okay lawyer, or I can have the really, really good lawyer for 20 pounds a month. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not on commission from um, ChatGPT, but for me, that's the bargain of the century. Um, if you pay for it, you're getting access to a lot more. Um, keep a record of what works for you, write it down. Um, one of my clients uh, in a workshop said um, that their, their principle, and I've just quoted it ever since because it's brilliant, is utilize it, but don't rely. Yes, there are problems with hallucinations. Yes, there are problems in other areas. Um, don't, don't necessarily, um, trust it in the same way as you wouldn't necessarily trust an article on Wikipedia. You want to go and find sources, but utilize it, but don't rely on it. Um, and always look for the simplest next step. Um, for instance, in content marketing, you get a lot of um, colleagues who go, right, I'm gonna do my content audit. And they try to do it in one prompt, um, one question. Actually, maybe we need to start with just a simple first step to try out and then see if that works, like um, reviewing messaging on a, on, a, on a website or something. Some tool recommendations. Um, yeah, I mean, so I actually, you know, I often hear about Jasper, I often hear about Writer and those other tools. People love them in content marketing. Actually, you had some of our early breakthroughs were actually using tools like Jasper, which were easier to use than the pre-GPT, chat GPT models. Um, but at the moment, the most sensible thing to do, I think, is um, get chat GPT plus 
um, because or premium, whatever version of it is, it leads in most tests. It's the it's the best performing one out there. You can build custom bots with it when you're when you're ready to. It calls them GPTs, which is really annoying because that also means something else. It's multimodal. There's some jargon for you. It can see images. Um, so literally, you can do a whiteboard or a bunch of basically legible post-it notes take a photo, shove them in, and it will tell you what's there. It can write up notes for you. That's just one use case, but being able to see and create images is, is really useful. Um, and also, if you go for GPT Teams um, or GT, GPT Enterprise, which is kind of a bigger thing, but GPT Teams is for teams of, I think, four people or more, then you won't have to share what's in the conversations with the model. So it won't incorporate anything you put into it back into um, the, the 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 model something that caught out I think some people at Samsung who were embarrassed by their plans turning up on there anyway um, apart from ChatGPT other honourable mentions Poe is an amazing app which I hear very little about out there but is really incredible um, it's from the people who built Quora which is a question and answer website but it actually allows you to use lots of different um, large language models lots of different Kind of competitors to chat gpt and gpt4 as well as gpt4 and again lets you build custom bots in a really simple way and it's really great for comparing and experimenting but so maybe not quite a, a starting out um, thing but um, really really useful microsoft copilot is amazing obviously microsoft uh, um, invested a lot in um in in chat gpt and they use that to power their co-pilot um, tools there is a free version which is very good and actually gives you access to some of um, the chat gpt4 this is getting quite technical isn't it their free version is really good and all of the microsoft tools are really good for things like doing research because they're attached to the live web and they'll give you references so you can check up on what they're saying and whether it's true um, and it's also built with security in mind because it's a kind of a business tool. Um, again, no shares in Microsoft, just saying. Um, perplexity is another one to try, add into your toolkit. It's AI powered search and it is blimmin' amazing for research. It again, gives you references. It's like having a Wikipedia which writes itself for you. I'm gonna give you two quick honorable mentions. Writing for Busy Readers is an amazing book about um, writing. But on its website, it has an AI um, that promotes the book. Um, and it's just incredible. You, you can pop in a short piece of text up to about, I think, 250 words, 150 words, something like that. And it will apply the rules of the book to make it much shorter and much better. Goblin Tools is, is I, I love this so much. Goblin Tools is a pound on, 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 the, on the Google Play Store or iOS Store. Um, and free to use on the website. Um, it's a collection of tools for neuro spicy minds, um, uh, for people who um, are not neurotypical. Um, and I tend to think that we're all not neurotypical sometimes, but it's amazing um, in that it breaks down tasks into steps for you, turns brain dumps into lists. It's great for when, it, it, it's just great, check it out. The last thing, I'll, one of the other things, sorry, so not quite the last thing, last thing I'll say um, is that working with ChatGPT and thinking like a scientist and all these sorts of things, it starts to change how you think about your work as well. Um, and it made me realize, for instance, that we're actually quite bad at prompting ourselves sometimes. Um, like, we'll just say write a presentation instead of actually thinking about the outcome, thinking about the steps we need to get there, we just kind of dive in. Um, so one of, the, one of the bots that we've written for ourselves and happy to share um, sort of looks at the any task you're doing and breaks it down into steps by asking you questions about how long it's going to take, what resources you've got, and then you can think about where to fit AI into it. Um, you'll get a lot further, a lot faster by by thinking about how you're prompting yourself, as it were. One last thing, a warning. Ethan Mollick, by the way, if you're interested at all in this area, he teaches at um, the Wharton Business School, University of Pennsylvania. Um, I haven't got that wrong, but um, he's got a, an, an excellent um, Substack newsletter. Um, he teaches about AI and using it practically. But one of the things he's constantly saying is that large language lot models are weird. And remember what I said, nobody knows anything and they're quite strange and they do all sorts of things that nobody's expecting. I, 
I won't get into it now, but um, that that last note of large language models, AI is really weird. It's because we don't understand them completely yet. This is a revolution that we're experiencing. It speeds up our thinking. It's a different, it's encouraging us to take different ways to look at the world, look at our work. Um, but it, it really is one of those kind of world upside down moments. Um, it's one of those arrival moments. So watch arrival, that's your homework. And like the Google scientists in the audience, just start thinking about how we're going to work differently with this sudden, strange, almost alien technology um, that's in our lives, cunningly disguised as a chatbot. And that's all of the things that I have to say. I hope that some of them were really useful to you and I really look forward to your questions. If we don't get to all of the questions today, I, I will post um, some answers. There's a QR code there and I think the Chartered Institute will also um, send out the answers to everyone. There's so much to talk about in this area. It's really hard to constrain um, yourself to in a, in a half hour session, but I tried to just offer the, the things that are brilliant noise we've learned um, in, in working really closely with this over the last couple of years. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. That was absolutely fascinating and some really, really brilliant recommendations in there. Um, we've had some questions in, so we're going to head into the uh, Q&A. Um, we've received some great questions so far, um, but please do continue to post any questions um, that you may have, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Like Anthony said, if we don't get through all of them, um, he will very kindly post um, the answers to those uh, for you. And just a little reminder that if you want to comment on the socials, then you can use the hashtag CIM events, which we've just popped up on the screen again for you. So looking at our first question, with your um, recommendation on investing in um, AI, what is the ROI that we could expect when investing in generative AI? Ooh, <laughs> that's a good one. So um, there's a number of ways of looking at this. Um, when we put the business case um, to clients for investing in the capability of using generative AI, um, we say that it's the mother of all business cases because PwC predicts that in 2030, there'll be 15.7 trillion dollars of um, GDP generated in the world because of generative AI. So the first business case is let's get a slice of that, but that's not ROI, is it? ROI tends to look at the here and now, and um, that tends to be about productivity and about the quality of work um, that, that, you, that you get back. And that's surprisingly easy to measure and people are beginning to share those measures. So the first, the first measures we saw were things like the Harvard study where it was up to about 25% productivity gain, so the equivalent of you know um, a day a week up to about a day or so a week of extra productivity per worker, um, and 40% increase in quality. Uh, I actually saw a government um, report last week in the Financial Times that said that, um, and this was the chief data officer in, in Downing Street, said that they look for a 3.55 uh, ROI return on investment, um, but that some of their early applications are generating ROI of up to 200, which I'm really glad they said, because it's the sort of thing I would feel foolish um, saying in public. It, it was almost unbelievable, but you, it's, it's not even, it's not even across all tasks. This is one of the things. But the ROI in some cases can, can be incredible. Um, like things that took an afternoon would take 20 minutes or things that took a week would take a team half an hour to do um, together. And that's that's an amazing ROI just in terms of productivity. The true ROI will come through as you have a workforce or, or teams that are literate in, in, in AI and start to think differently and start to think about new ways to create value, new business models, new ideas. But we can't predict what that is yet. Um, but already the, the productivity case is, is pretty compelling. Fantastic, thank you. And, and kind of keeping with that theme of productivity, um, one of the questions has asked what will be um, the expected added value when working with AI, um, particularly looking at 
where there may be something that AI can't replace us as a human, um, but what, what the ad added value we might expect from working with AI. Yeah, so um, there's also, it's really, one of the things, there was, a, there was an Economist article recently that, that put it really well, is that it's a truly remarkable technology, but it's so remarkable that that presents a challenge to figure out things like this question you know it's 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 going to be down to individuals it's going to be down to specific um experiences there i, I think there's an awful lot of things that ai won't be able to replace but then there's an awful lot of things that we do that it would just be wonderful if we could stop doing um there are i think of any kind of thing like wading through emails or sitting in a meeting that i shouldn't be in or um, or spending a little bit too long just trying to find a document that's somewhere in our server that um, that I need right now. All of those sorts of things are uses of cognitive energy that could be put into other things. And I've got, I mean, I'm, I'm sure like many people, I've got a list as long as my arm of, of projects that I would like to get to that would be really exciting and interesting if I didn't get caught up in the day to day. Um, so it's yeah i think there's all sorts of things and i also think that rather than replacing although it will replace in 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 some circumstances it's it's more about how can it get us there faster and then what what can we do because we're able to get there faster um i saw a lovely example of um a writer talking about this yesterday who was saying you know one of the things that they like to do is instead of using it to generate um an outline for an article they just do a massive splurge of everything they want to say in a really unstructured way and then get the AI to pull the structure out of that so they can see it more clearly. And I've certainly experienced that um, just using meeting notes like um, Fathom Video, I highly recommend, which summarizes what you said on a call. And quite often after I've done a kind of, especially if I've done a, um, like a presentation to a client or a pitch, I'll look at the summary and I'll think, gosh, let's, let's put it better than I could. But it's it's just remixing what you're saying or what you're thinking in a more efficient way, in a way that you probably could do, but actually after that call or that meeting, you're probably too knackered to. Um, yeah. yeah. I hope, so hope that's sort of effectively right. supporting. And one of the questions actually, I think is, is somewhat a question and also a, a really good statement saying, um, is using AI properly, um, that's to say using rather than relying, which you're, notes also indicated um, so is using AI properly using rather than relying in marketing likely to be a distinguishing factor in terms of being competitive in the future which I think you highlighted there it's a case of using and seeing how it assists us and, and helps us be more productive and yeah, so, ultimately yeah. Yeah. sorry yeah um, yes that's that, that's absolutely right. I mean, and competitive is where we go with the with the business case for this, um, and the incredible um, importance of making it a priority for organisations. If you want to put it kind of starkly, then um, this the, the weird thing about this technology is that it's it's available everywhere. It's just really hard to figure out exactly what you're going to do with it, um, and that means that your competitors have it as well. So it's a race for who can work out what the competitive advantage of using it is. Um, and it's it's really just best to get in the race and start and start trying to do faster laps rather than waiting for the perfect race car for you to be designed as opposed to use a, it's a Formula One metaphor. Excellent, yeah, absolutely. Um, and one really good question that's um, just come in is what is the best case that you've seen so far in marketing when it comes to generative AI? The, oh, the best case, um, the best use case. Yeah, so it's really interesting because a lot of the early cases were about creative and, oh, wow, look what we can do with generative video. I mean, I think that part of the craft is interesting, um, but the best use case I've seen um, so far is from a partner who um, uh, specializes in video production and um, they've, they've built a tool so that clients of theirs who tend to be able to afford you know, two or three big video shoots a year. They've expanded 
the way that they do those shoots and then built an AI infrastructure for analyzing and um, breaking them up so they can remix them and put in new visuals very, very quickly and give them many more options. And why I say that's the best use case is because the effect of that's not being, okay, so we won't do big campaigns anymore and we don't need any creatives anymore on this. It's because it expands the demand for for good quality um, creative. It, it gives people more options to try things out. Um, I think the only way, um, and the best cases um, in, in marketing are people who are experimenting with it and using it to figure out their smallest problems and then their biggest problems. But I like that one because they've, they've packaged it together quite well and because um, you can see that it's the whole process that they're looking at rather than a, how can I replace a cameraman? How can I replace a, a shoot? How can I replace an editor? That's like, that's really basic thinking that's gonna miss the value. You know, it's gonna get you a saving today um, at the cost of like a huge breakthrough tomorrow. Fantastic, thank you, Anthony, and thank you for taking all of those questions. Um, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for for our webinar today. I would like to thank Anthony once again, and also the CIM Greater London Committee for organising the webinar. We do hope you've enjoyed the session and found it interesting and worthwhile. So that just leaves me to say a final thank you for joining us today. We do hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Take care, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.